All right, well, let's, uh, let's pray and get into the word. <laughs> Father, thank you for this morning, Lord, and uh, for the worship where we get to praise your name together as your children and brothers, brothers and sisters and you gathered uh, under one purpose and one name, in the name of Jesus. So we thank you for this moment here this morning. And as we read your word, we pray for your spirit to be upon us and for a powerful interpretation and application to our lives to be given by your spirit to us so that we can be directed by you and hear your voice and draw closer to you, Lord. We pray for all those things this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, if you want to open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 14. 1 Corinthians 14. The title for our study this morning is Gathering with Order. Gathering with Order, 1 Corinthians 14. Not like a McDonald's order, but like a <laughs> like an organization order. I uh, I work from home in my non-church job, and you do that via you work from home via computer like all your work's on the computer for the first half of this week my computer was broken so that makes working at home quite difficult i had to do all my work off of my little phone and it was just the worst it was terrible i was having to try to work through spreadsheets on this phone and i was like having to do video conferencing on this phone and then i had to like have my coworkers do work my work for me as I walked them through it when you know, the phone wasn't capable of accomplishing that my phone was like glitching out couldn't handle all of the all of the <laughs> stuff so it was just really terrible it was an absolute horrible experience but computer got fixed halfway through the week and the second half of the week much better got a new computer actually and, and much better uh, it's got a cool fingerprint thing where you get into the computer so second half of the week went much much better now our chapter this morning talks a lot about spiritual gifts but really it's concluding this four chapter section about how we conduct ourselves in church gatherings what's been clear through these four chapters is that we're called to use our unique spiritual gifts and our abilities and our strengths that God has given each one of us to minister to others in the church. Each one of us are given unique giftings from the Lord, and each one of us are called and commanded to use those giftings in the church. Now that requires, first of all, it requires our active involvement in the church in order to use our gifts in the church. Second of all, it requires that we take a step of faith to desire the gifts in the first place, to seek spiritual gifts, and then to use those spiritual gifts in the context of, of the church. And then third, it requires us to interact with the church in a godly manner. In chapter 11, it talked about approaching church gatherings with reverence, reverence for the Lord. In chapter 12, it talked about having unity in, in the church and church gatherings. In chapter 13, it talked about interacting with others with love. And here in chapter 14, it talks about our services having order. So we're interacting in the church with our gifts in this way, with reverence and unity and love and order, not however we feel like, not however we want to interact with the church, but in this manner that the Lord instructs us. I think a lot of Christians try to live a Christian life without this key piece of it, without this type of involvement in the church and this type of sharing of our spiritual gifts, us using our gifts to help others and others using their gifts to help us. It's like trying to uh, work your remote job from your phone. It's, it's not a good experience. I mean, technically, it doesn't kill you. Like, technically, I still have a job, but it's, it's not fun. It's way harder than it needs to be. It puts a burden on those around you, and the longer you live like that, the greater the consequences are. It's, it's kind of sad to me that I think 
there's a lot of Christians who have never experienced walking with the Lord in this context in a way where they're plugged into their church enough to be able to share their spiritual gifts with others and, and serve others in that way, and they're being able to be ministered to by the church, other people using their spiritual gifts to help them as well. So hopefully these chapters, these four chapters that we've gone through, have helped encourage us on the topic. Now, churches have many different views on spiritual gifts. There are those who have an under-emphasis on the gifts. They don't emphasize the gifts enough, either because they believe that the spiritual gifts have completely ceased, that at one time the church was called to use spiritual gifts, but they no longer exist anymore, or because the, there's churches that believe that the spiritual gifts aren't actual abilities, they're just ministries and roles in the church. So those are two examples of churches that have an underemphasis on spiritual gifts. There are also churches that have an overemphasis on spiritual gifts. Examples of those are churches that believe that certain gifts or all the gifts are necessary for salvation. Uh, the gift of tongues, which our chapter talks a lot about today, is one of those gifts that some churches believe you have to be able to speak in tongues in order to prove salvation. Uh, other, another overemphasis on the gifts is practicing the gifts in an uncontrolled or disorderly manner. The gift of tongues is one that churches use this for as well, where just out of control. You might have experienced that at some churches, or you might have seen videos of it online, where churches are just out of control with this chaotic thing that they are calling the Spirit. Now, I believe all of those views on spiritual gifts are disproven by Paul in this chapter. Paul mentions in this chapter the gifts being active, and he has no mention of them ever stopping. He just assumes that this is what the Christian life involved in church looks like. Paul describes these gifts as abilities, not just ministries in the church, but he describes them as things that people can do, abilities. Paul talks about the gifts, about not everyone having the same gift. He doesn't assume that everybody has the gift of tongues in the chapter, but he also does assume that everybody has a gift. He lists out gifts as an example, assuming they have a gift. And Paul focuses in this chapter on the gifts needing to be used. So we're called to use our gifts, but we're called to use them in a controlled and orderly fashion in this chapter. So understanding Paul's position on this from the chapter, we strongly believe that uh, we, we believe in the ongoing use of spiritual gifts in the church today. We believe that those are abilities. We believe that we're called to actively use them, and, we're, and we believe we're called to actively use them in order, in a certain way in the church. So that's what we're talking about today. We'll start in verses 1 through 33, which focuses on the order of the spiritual gifts, and we'll read verse 1 through 5. Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy, for he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God, for no one understands him. However, in the spirit he speaks mysteries, but he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. I wish you all spoke with tongues, but even more that you prophesied, for he who prophesy, prophesies is greater than he who speaks with tongues, unless indeed he interprets that the church may receive edification. So as we learned last chapter, our main pursuit should be love as Christians, and our main pursuit in the church should be love loving God and loving others, not just any type of love, but specifically love that we can only get from the Lord, love that we learn from the Lord, from him, the way that he loves us. And that love that we get directly from God and learn from the way he loves us, that's the love that we then go and love others in the church with. So out of that pursuit, out of our pursuit to love others, that's why we should desire spiritual gifts. Out of our pursuit of loving others, I need help in order to love them better, in order to serve them better. So I need spiritual gifts from the Lord in order to be able to love and serve them better. Now that order of motivation is vital. We should desire the gifts of the Spirit because we love. Out of our love, we should desire the gifts of the Spirit, not out of selfish reasons, not out of prideful reasons. 
If we want the gifts of the Spirit because we feel like it's going to make us better, it's a selfish reason. It's not motivated out of love of others. If we feel like we want spiritual gifts because we want others to be able to see how gifted we are, that's pride. That's not out of love for others. The motivation for us wanting the spiritual gifts in the first place needs to be uh, how I can love other people better if, 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 I, if the Lord gives me these gifts, I can use them to love other people better. Now, all of the spiritual gifts uh, are, we're, we're not all of the spiritual gifts are listed in this chapter, but Paul uses two popular gifts in Corinth. Remember, he's writing this letter to the church in Corinth. He's using two gifts that are popular to the people in Corinth as an example, the gifts of prophecy and the gift of tongues. The gift of prophecy, we know, can be a foretelling or a forthtelling. A foretelling is prophecy of the future, telling the future. A forthtelling is explaining the present, God explaining the present to us through prophecy. The gift of tongues can be a human tongue, a human language that is not known by the person who's speaking it. It's a spiritual gift of being able to speak in that other human language. Or it could be a spiritual heavenly language that nobody on earth knows. And all of those apply to the gift of prophecy and to the gift of tongues. Now, it's interesting. Many people often desire the gift of tongues more than the gift of prophecy. But tongues without an interpretation only ministers to the one who's speaking it. The one who's speaking that language is ministered to spiritually, but nobody else, if they don't know what it means, can be ministered to by it. Whereas prophecy ministers to whoever hears that prophecy and, and uh, is blessed by that prophecy. So if we're really motivated by love, we should desire the spiritual gifts that help other people more, the ones that are more useful. So why does Paul even say that some gifts are greater than others? If we're all part of one body, why is he saying some gifts are better than others? It's because what's greater is the motivation of love. The motivation of love in the gift is greater than a gift that's motivated by self-interest. So we should desire spiritual gifts, all of us as Christians, should desire and seek spiritual gifts. But the motivation should be our love for one another. How can we love each other more? That should be what motivates our spiritual gifts, not our self-interest. Some common ways Christians ignore the gifts is by saying, I don't really understand the, the spiritual gifts. Or, you know, those things seem weird. It's like something that, you know, it's just weird. Or I don't really do that kind of thing, the spiritual thing. Or I don't have time to serve people with uh, my gifts. Or I just don't want to. I'm not interested in that. Or I'll let someone else serve in that way. Or I'm too embarrassed to use my spiritual gifts. Or I'm too shy or I'm, I'm above doing that kind of thing, or I, I only use the gifts that make me look good. Nobody probably says that, but like in honesty, like I'm only going to use the gifts that make me look good to others. All of that kind of thing, are, those are all excuses used to ignore the gifts that Christians use to ignore the gifts in the church. But all of those excuses are just a lack of love for others. When people in the church actually need us to use the gifts that God has given us to serve them. That's why God gave us the gifts. It's because there's other people in the church that need us to serve them in that way. So the question shouldn't be what we feel comfortable doing. Yeah, even, even avoiding serving others with our gifts, even that is a lack of love because we're letting our uncomfortability about it uh, get in the way of serving others. So the question shouldn't be what we feel comfortable doing. It should be, what is the biggest need in, in the church? What is the biggest need with other people that I'm equipped to serve? Either uh, physically equipped, you know, uh, mentally equipped, financially equipped to serve, or spiritually equipped to serve in my spiritual gifts. What's the biggest need that I'm equipped to serve? Verse 12 through, or 6 through 12. But now, brethren... If I come to you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you unless I speak to you either by revelation, by knowledge, by prophesying, or by teaching? Even things without life, whether flute or harp, when they make a sound, unless they make a distinction in the sounds, how will, be, how will it be known what is piped or played? For if the trumpet makes an uncertain sound, who will prepare for battle? So likewise you, unless you utter by the tongue, 
words easy to understand, how, it, how will it be known what is spoken? For you will be speaking into the air. There are, it may be, so many kinds of languages in the world, and none of them is without significance. Therefore, if I do not know the meaning of the language, I shall be a foreigner to him who speaks, and he who speaks will be a foreigner to me. Even so you, since you are zealous for spiritual gifts, let it be for the edification of the church that you seek to excel. So to illustrate the point, what if Paul came to Corinth and when he came there, he spoke nothing but the gift of tongues, nothing but a tongue that nobody could understand. It'd be completely useless because nobody would know what he's talking about. He wouldn't, it wouldn't help anybody if he just came and just spoke tongues. Whereas if he speaks in revelation and he speaks in knowledge and he speaks in prophecy and he speaks in teaching, all of those things help the people in Corinth be edified, be built up, be strengthened. They, it helps them learn. It helps them grow in their faith. Now take music for example. If our worship team got up here and just started blah, 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 playing random notes and stuff, that would do nothing for us. We'd all sit there like, this is crazy. Like, we'll turn off their mics. <laughs> But if they come up here and play specific notes for a specific purpose, then it creates a song. And then we're all worshiping together in the Lord. Or take war, for example. When specific commands or specific cues are given to soldiers, they know what to do. They know when it's time to fight. They know when it's time to retreat. They, they know where to go, when to go. But if you're just saying random cues and stuff, like a baseball cues and like the how they give random cues in baseball then the the army is just confused and they just don't know what to do and nobody's going to fight nobody's going to retreat they're just going to sit there and and lose or take the super bowl later today when uh when coaches call in on the headset they call in the plays to the quarterback on the headset if they're calling plays from the play sheet that they practiced all week for then the team knows what plays to call but if they're just saying random words into the headset, the team won't know what to do. They'll be like the Buffalo Bills. They'll just fail and lose. <laughs> I'm just kidding. That was just for Brian. <laughs> but yeah, they'll just, I mean, the Buffalo Bills are not in the Super Bowl, so they had to lose at some point. I'm just kidding. The Niners, my team lost last two weeks ago, so I'm there too. They didn't have a quarterback. But anyways, side note. All that's beside the point. In the same way that uh, in those situations, in the music or the war or the, or the football situation, in the same way that you need specific things in order to make a difference, the best way to minister to others is, it, is to make it easy for others to understand the ministry to them. Otherwise, we might as well not talk at all. Otherwise, we're just talking to ourselves if other people can't understand. The whole purpose of language is to communicate meaning. So if we babble in unintelligible gifts of tongues, we just alienate each other. We're not communicating any meaning. And that's the opposite of the purpose of the spiritual gifts in the first place. The purpose of the gifts is to edify and help each other, build each other up, serve each other. So to just confuse each other is the opposite Spiritual gifts are meant to serve others, not separate ourselves from others. Now we can use the themes of these past four chapters to hold ourselves accountable. Is the use of my gifts in the church bringing reverence to the church gatherings? Are my gifts bringing unity to our church, to our body? Are my gifts an expression of love to my brothers and sisters in Christ here? Do my gifts fall within the order of the services, within the structure of the services? Are they being used in that structure? Or am I using or not using my gifts selfishly? That'll help us kind of check ourselves and our use of our gifts in the church. Verse 13 through 19. Therefore, let him who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. What is the conclusion then? I will pray with the Spirit, and I will also pray with the understanding. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will also sing with the understanding. 
Otherwise, if you bless with the Spirit, how will he who occupies the place of the uninformed say amen at your giving of thanks, since he does not understand what you say? For you indeed give thanks well, but the other is not edified. I thank my God I speak with tongues more than you all. Yet in the church, I would rather speak five words with my understanding that I may teach others also than 10,000 words in a tongue. So for those with the gift of tongues, when spoken at church, there needs to be an interpretation so others can benefit from it as well. Speaking in tongues ministers to your spirit by just doing it, but it doesn't minister to your mind without an interpretation, without an understanding. And when we pray and when we sing in church, our goal is to engage both our spirit and our mind corporately, collect, collectively, all of us engaging our spirit, our spirits and our minds together, which is why when we pray as a church, we, we pray, we focus on praying with theological accuracy, that we're not praying things that don't match with scripture. And that's why we're extremely thoughtful about the meaning behind our worship songs. We don't play worship songs just because they sound good or just because we like the song. We, we play worship songs because of the meaning of the words. Because the goal of our church gatherings is for everyone to be able to say, amen. <laughs> the word amen means basically, I agree with that. I agree with that prayer or I'm praying that with you as well. So the goal is for all of us to be able to say, I agree, I'm, I'm praying that as well. But how can we agree with a prayer in tongues if we don't know the interpretation of the tongues? We can't honestly say amen to that. Now, praying in tongues is great for the person doing it, but it's leaving everyone else out if there's not an interpretation. Paul is very blessed by his personal ability to speak in tongues. And he says that he speaks in tongues constantly in his personal life. But he'd rather speak five words that other people could understand than 10,000 words in his gift of tongues that nobody can understand. So when we use our spiritual gifts, not just tongues, but everything, we must do so in a way that serves others. In the case of the gift of tongues, we can use the gift privately as much as we feel led to, but only publicly when there's a gift, when there's someone with the gift of interpretation or when we have an interpretation to be able to explain it to the church. So it takes some prompting by the Holy Spirit to know when the appropriate time to speak in tongues in a corporate setting is. And with all the gifts, the purpose of this corporate gathering is for us to benefit from one another. So we should constantly be thinking in the church, how can I use my gifts to serve someone else? We should be scanning the church thinking, how can I use my spiritual gifts to serve other people here? We should be looking at the different ministries in the church. Which one of these ministries is a good format for me to use my spiritual gifts in and be able to bless other people in the church? Verse 20 through 25 Brethren, do not be children in understanding. However, in malice be babes, but in understanding be mature. In the law it is written, with men of other tongues and other lips, I will speak to this people, and yet for all that they will not hear me, says the Lord. Therefore, tongues are a sign not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. But prophesying is not for unbelievers, but for those who believe. Therefore, if the whole church comes together in one place and all speak with tongues, and there come in those who are uninformed or unbelievers, will they not say that you are out of your mind? But if all prophesy and an unbeliever or an uninformed person comes in, he is convinced by all. He is convinced convicted by all and thus the secrets of his heart are revealed and so falling down on his face he will worship god and report that god is truly among you paul says stop acting like children except regarding evil you can be innocent to evil like children but in all other ways stop acting like children paul quotes isaiah 28 which is also referencing deuteronomy 28 but in isaiah 28 he, he quotes that to recall when Israel refused to listen to the voice of the Lord. And the punishment for them refusing to listen to the voice of the Lord was that they were taken into Assyrian captivity. 
And you know what happens when you get taken into captivity by another nation? You're surrounded by people who don't speak your language. So you didn't listen to the voice of the Lord, and now you can't understand anything. Now everybody around you is speaking another language. Likewise, when we ignore the voice of the Lord on this topic, we'll miss out on what the Lord wants to bless us with because we won't be able to understand anything. So speaking in uninterpreted tongues means nothing to unbelievers. In fact, it's a bad witness to unbelievers for them to see people just speaking crazily in uninterpreted tongues because when, uh, when believers see that, these, wi- these wild speaking in random tongues that nobody can understand, uh, non-believers just think the Christians are crazy. Even if the Christians feel like they are super spiritual because they're being able to do all this spiritual speaking, the non-believer sees that. It's like, yeah, I would never want to be a part of that. But if unbelievers hear us prophesying truth, if that's what they hear, that proves our faith. And it draws those unbelievers to become believers because they see that they are known by God. They see that God truly knows them. And that makes them have awe for the Lord. The way we use our spiritual gifts should point people to Christ, not push people away from Christ. Now, this is, there's this attitude that some Christians have toward non believers and even toward believers that they disagree with or it's like this this childish bragging attitude of like ha 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 like you're not in the club like you don't know what we know like you're not spiritual like us you know this kind of attitude that christians can get like overly defensive about like how they're different and you think we're weird because we're better than you like that type of childish attitude in reality that's us using pride as a defense mechanism so that we don't feel bad about ourselves when other people look at us and think we're weird. So we're putting up this wall of pride. But our goal shouldn't be to throw weird Christian stuff at people so that they see that we're weird and so that we can make fun of them for not understanding us. Our goal should be to show people how welcoming and inviting the love of Jesus is. Not become something we're not. Just show them what the love of Jesus is which is extremely welcoming and inviting, not like we're in a special club and you're out of it. And if people happen to think we're weird uh, for, for reasons, it doesn't bother us because of two things. One, our identity is in Christ, so we don't care if people think we're weird or not. Uh, we don't want them to think we're weird, but like it doesn't bother us. And two, we're too busy trying to love them to care that they think we're weird. We're too busy wanting to show the love of Christ to them to care about, you know, if they think that we're weird. Verse 26 through 33. How is it then, brethren, whenever you come together, each of you has a psalm, has a teaching, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. If anyone speaks in a tongue, let there be two or at the most three, each in turn, and let one interpret. But if there is no interpreter, let him keep silent in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. Let two or three prophets speak and let the others judge. But if anything is revealed to another who sits by, let the first keep silent. For you can all prophesy one by one that all may learn and all may be encouraged. And the spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace as in all the churches of the saints. So during church gatherings, we're called to use our spiritual gifts to edify one another, to strengthen each other. Paul lists examples of these gifts, gift of psalms, gift of teaching, tongues, revelation, and interpretation. If you want the complete list of gifts, if you want to show, uh, yeah, so on our website is a guide to the complete lift, list of gifts. The guide looks like this. has all of the gifts, gifts listed out by chapter, listed out in a numbered list. It has theology on the gifts all there. On the second pages after this, it explains what some of those gifts look like and other chapter references. Uh, if you went and saw this when we covered this a couple chapters ago, we've updated this since then with more information. So you might want to go look at it again. And here's the link if you want to go look at it. 
media.calvarystockton.com slash files slash what are spiritual gifts with dashes in between it dot pdf. Uh, maybe we should make that more complicated for you. <laughs> It'll also be in the notes of this, of this uh, sermon too if you want to look at that later. But we're given examples of how to conduct our church services and use spiritual gifts with order in this passage. If anyone speaks in tongues, it should be a limited number of people, two at the most three at, at a time, and all of them should be going one at a time, not all at once. And before the next one speaks, we should wait for an interpretation of the first one. First person speaks in tongues, we stop, we wait for an interpretation if there is one before moving on to another person speaking in tongues. But if no one interprets no one has the gift of interpretation or is given an interpretation for that tongue, then we should just hold off there and we shouldn't speak more in tongues. There's a similar prophes- process for the gift of prophecy. A limited number of people speaking prophecy in a church service, one at a time, and we wait for the church to assess the prophecy, to interpret the prophecy, to know if the prophecy is true or not before we move on to the next prophecy. Even if we receive some exciting revelation from the Lord and we just can't wait to say it, we just can't let this, wait to speak in this tongue or can't wait to say this prophecy out loud, we're told to wait our turn. That way, everyone can hear it. Because if it truly is from the Lord, then everyone, needs, everyone in the church needs to hear that message from the Lord. Exercising our spiritual gifts is not an out-of-control experience. We can control, there are gifts We can control how we use them. And we're supposed to use them in order because God doesn't create confusion. God creates order. He creates peace. He creates clarity, even in how we use the gifts that he's given us. So our order of service is actually commanded by God. Structure of the service is order, one person speaking at a time. Our spiritual expression should not be out of control. Biblical spirituality is a filling of the spirit. It's not an emptying of our mind. It's not some drunkenness in the spirit. It, the Bible describes it as a filling of the spirit. We're getting more sharp, more in tune, not less sharp, not more crazy. When I was in Spain last summer, I had to speak mostly in Spanish, because most people only spoke Spanish. I'm not very good at Spanish. So I just felt really dumb the whole time because everything I said had to be like at a kindergarten level because those are the words I know. So like I had to take whatever thought I had and I had to like dumb it down to whatever level of vocabulary I had to be able to communicate. Well, a church with gifts being used in an out of control manner when nobody can understand it, that's a dumbed down church. It's dumbed down to just, it's limited to just what people can understand out of all the craziness. On the other hand, a church without spirituality is a church that's asleep. No matter how intellectual that church is, no matter how many Bible verses they can quote, if there's no spirituality, there's no life, they're just asleep. Now, one of the ways we can try to, one of the ways we do try to help our church meet that balance of spirituality but not out of control, is by providing specific spaces for us to use certain gifts in our church. So, for example, on Sunday morning during our services, where we give opportunity f- opportunities for people to use their gifts within ministries at the church. We have different areas of ministries. Ho- uh, w- the welcome team, we have the coffee team, we have the setup teardown team, we have the worship team, we have the media team, we have... Uh, you know, different ministries going on all over the place, and people can use their gifts within one of those ministries. Also, people can use their gifts within fellowship after service, which is something that we stress. We want everybody to stay here after service and and, uh, fellowship with one another. Our midweek service gives opportunities for people to use their gifts in group discussions. We have that kind of a format on midweek service. We also have worship and prayer where we can use our spiritual gifts. That's like the perfect time to speak in tongues or give a prophecy. And in fact, uh, we don't have worship and prayer uh, every, we have worship every week, but not that time of worship and prayer every midweek. But this midweek service, um, four days from now, we do, it is our worship and prayer service. It just so happens. So we'll have that time where it's appropriate for the use of the gifts in that way. 
Our men's, women's groups, our small groups give opportunities for people to use their gifts in a more intimate setting with one another. And our outreach ministries give opportunities for people to use their gifts in the communities. So we have all these different areas where people can use their different gifts appropriately. It provides order, but also provides an opportunity for people to use their gifts in our church here. So these first 33 verses were all about order in how we use our spiritual gifts in the church. These last six verses or so are about order in our spiritual roles in the church. I'll we'll read 34 through 40. Let your women keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but they are to be submissive, as the law also says. And if they want to learn something, let them ask their own husbands at home, for it is shameful for women to speak in church. Or did the word of God come originally from you? Or was it you only that it reached? If anyone thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things which I write to you are the commandments of the Lord. But if anyone is ignorant, let him be ignorant. Therefore, brethren, desire earnestly to prophesy and do not forbid to speak with tongues, that all things be done decently and in order. Just the way the English translation works on this just just makes it just makes it just twist the knife on this passage. Let your women be silent. Urgh. This concept of order in the church services doesn't stop at spiritual gifts. This concept of order in church services extends to teaching, extends to the theology of the church. For example, when Paul says, "Let women be silent in the church," he doesn't mean women can't talk at all. <laughs> that you know, we better not hear any women today speaking after service. That's not what he's saying. We know that's not what he's saying because in chapter 11, he assumes women will be speaking in the church. Not just speaking, but using their gifts in the church. Like making an impact on the church. So not only are they just, they're not just talking, but they're talking and making a huge contribution to the church. In addition to that, he just told people in verses 26 through 33, what we just read, he just told everybody to be silent in certain scenarios. So we know this isn't saying women can't talk at all. We know this is like a specific situation that he's addressing. Now, Paul's point here is the same point that he made in chapter 11 when we covered that. Same point he makes in 1 Timothy 2, that God created a leadership structure in the church to establish order in the church. Now, this is not unique to the church. The entire world works in leadership structures, and that's not an accident. Just like different people have different gifts, different people have different roles in the church. And it doesn't make any one gift or any one role less valuable. In fact, we learned in chapter 11, it's the complete opposite. It makes all the gifts and all the roles more impactful. If everybody had the same gift or everybody had the same role, it kind of makes them all worthless. But if everybody has different gifts and roles, just like parts of the human body, a hand, a foot, etc., then each one of those things, its usefulness or its impact is magnified. So when 1 Timothy 2 says, I do not permit a woman to teach or have authority over a man, what it means by that is that God has different roles for women, but equally important and impactful roles for women in the church. So in our passage today, Paul's describing a role that only some men have, not, not even all men, but a role of teaching the church and of leading the doctrine of the church, discussing what the church should believe, what our stances on theology are, and communicating that to the church. The church appoints certain men, not all the men in the church, certain men in the church to teach and determine that theology of the church. Now, if a woman wants to question or challenge the theology of the church, that's awesome. Great. We want to make sure we're, we're doing what's biblical. And so then Paul gives us a process of how to do that with order. And the first step of that process is to work with your husband to come to a household agreement on the issue, on the concern that you have about the theology or the teaching. That means you and your husband sitting down and studying theology together, studying the Bible, studying scripture, working through the issue. A lot of the time, that solves the problem right there. 
but you study and you work with your household on the whatever is the question, the, the theological question that you have, and you end up coming to a conclusion that, yeah, this we're right on. Sometimes that doesn't solve the issue or the concern. And so step two happens where after you've worked it out and you've come to an agreement as a, as a household, then use the proper communication channels in the church to communicate that concern to the people who are teaching the church and to the people who are establishing the theology of the church. Sometimes that could involve like a husband meeting with a pastor about the concern. Sometimes it's a husband and wife meeting with a pastor. It could be a handful of different practical scenarios, but it's just using that appropriate channel. Now for single women who aren't married to like godly husbands in the church or, or women who are married to unbelievers, the church will provide other avenues that, that function in a similar way, like a women's leader or, uh, or a ministry leader that you can have that same sort of discussion, work through the scriptures together, and then bring it up through the appropriate channels as well. The point here in this passage is not that women aren't smart enough to bring up good points. In fact, it's the opposite, that it's saying there's, there's a way to do it that will be helpful to the church. The point isn't that women aren't important enough to speak for themselves. That's the opposite. It's that there's, there's a format for this to take place. The point is to avoid the church being just an out of control, everybody yelling. You know, one, one moment I say something you disagree with and you yell out at me right now, no, you suck, pastor, that's wrong. And then someone else is yelling, no, he's right. And then we're all just yelling at each other. That's, that's what this is trying to solve, is that we're not just a mass of people arguing and debating and telling each other how they're wrong, but that there's appropriate channels to where we can really understand what the concerns are and really make sure they are real concerns, but then understand them and then work through them together. In the same way, just yelling in tongues, nobody can understand anything. In the same way, just yelling our disagreements at each other, nobody can understand we're not addressing anything. So this makes sure that actual concerns are addressed and heard and understood. Now this process leans on the family unit and it leans on the church leadership to be able to organize and address all of the concerns as they come up, instead of just it being a yelling fest. Now, similar to his approach in chapter 11, Paul's not looking to debate this point with his readers for very long. This is the Lord's structure to all the churches, he says. So you either trust God's leadership, or you don't trust God's leadership. But this is the way that he established the church. Now, those who consider themselves spiritual must follow God's order in order to be spiritual. Otherwise, we're just pretending to have spirituality, but in reality, we just want to do whatever we want to do. We're just making it up as we go along. So we should desire spiritual gifts. We should desire spiritual roles in the church, and we should practice them within the order that God has established. God calls us to order our roles in the church He calls us to have order in how we communicate our concerns or disagreements in theology and how we lead the church as well. There's this husband-wife team that led an outreach ministry at a church that I used to serve at. And they'd been there for years. But we were starting to make more changes in the church and changes to their ministry that were needed. And one of the spouses was like working with us. They were, that spouse was like communicating their concerns to us. We were like hearing their concerns and we were like finding an agreement with that spouse. The other spouse was giving us the silent treatment, would not talk to us at all, not look at us in meetings and stuff. And then would go to, it was an outreach ministry, go to the people in the community and talk bad about us. To the people in the community that they were serving, we found out just because those people in the community came and told us that they were talking bad about us. And like called the city to try to get us in legal trouble as, as a church. So like one spouse is like working with us. The other spouse is like not talking to us and then causing all this division and problems. Now think about how much simpler that whole situation would have been if the two spouses got together, studied the word, got to an agreement with one another on what their position is about the, about the church, what their disagreements are, what their concerns are, and then as a unit 
came and talked to the church leadership, and we were able to work through that together. So much simpler, so much less division. But because it was just this kind of, I mean, from one end of the, of, uh, from one of the spouses, just this yelling in the community about the problems and not, not in agreement, not working through with it, it just didn't work at all. I think that's a great example of how the Lord's process really does, really does work for us. Now, we have to set our egos aside here. It's not about what kind of respect or what kind of recognition that we feel we deserve. This is not a question of equality because Paul has been crystal clear on how God values everyone in the church, every single person. The whole point of these four chapters is to put others first, put others before ourselves in the church. So with our egos out of the way, with us only thinking about what's best for others, the process that God set up here to deal with our concerns in the church really does work well. But when we ignore our roles out of pride, then we just create disorder. We just create this yelling match that creates problems and division. So God calls us to order in our spiritual gifts in the church. God calls us to order in our spiritual roles in the church. And I think a helpful like final takeaway from this chapter is for you personally to pray through what spiritual gifts the Lord has given you that you're aware of, what spiritual gifts that you would desire to have, what spiritual gifts that you just don't know of that the Lord has given you, what your role in our church could be, how you could use those spiritual gifts to benefit other people in our church. Really sincerely pray through that with the Lord. That's what we're called to do in the chapter. Seek desire, seek those spiritual gifts, and then use them. And I tell you, there's plenty of opportunity to use them here in the church. So that's, I think that's a great takeaway for all of us is to prayerfully think through, work with the Lord through, what are my spiritual gifts? What is my role in the church? How does the Lord want to use me, use my gifts to benefit everybody else here? Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you for uh, this important calling of uh, us to the work of the ministry. You've called us to be gifted in certain ways and be take on certain roles in the church so that we can... Uh, serve you, love you, serve others, and love others better so that all of us to the, together can collectively uh, grow and be edified and be equipped, be strengthened, and so that y you can show us how valued we, we are here. So we thank you for um, that kind of a calling that it isn't required, but the way that you set this up works really, really well for it. Thank you for that. If we keep our heads bowed and our eyes closed for a second, if you've never trusted Jesus for salvation, the Lord wants to give you a brand new life, make you brand new. Lift all the burdens off your shoulders and carry them for you. He wants to give you gifts like these abilities that you can use to love him and love others. He wants you to be a part of a community a family like this. So if you've never trusted Jesus for salvation and you'd like to do that for the first time today, if you want to raise your hand, I'd love to pray with you. Does anybody want to trust in Jesus for the first time today? Those of you who are raising your hands online, let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for these who are choosing to trust you with their salvation. I pray that they believe in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ on the cross and that by trusting in him that they can get eternal life, complete forgiveness of their sins, and hope for what happens after death. I pray that you grant those things to them this morning and that you build a personal relationship with them. If we keep our heads bowed and our eyes closed for a second longer, and uh, if the Lord has spoken to you about what's possible for the gifts that he's given you and how important those gifts are, and if he's put a little bit of a spark in your heart about using those gifts in the context of his church, 
I'd, I'd love to pray for you to continue to develop those gifts or find those gifts, seek them, uh, and for the Lord to use them, find a spot for, for them to be used here. So if, if that applies to you, I'd love to pray for you if you want to raise your hand. Amen. 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 Anybody else want to be included in this prayer? Amen. Amen. There's a little spirit speaking to anybody else. Amen. Father, I thank you for these who are raising their hands because you've spoken to them and put a fire in their heart for the gifts that you've given them and the roles that you've given them or, or plan to give them, plan to reveal to them. So I pray that they help. They, they have a desire and that desire grows from today. It doesn't, that fire is not put out after today. And then from that desire that they can actively seek the gifts of the Spirit and seek what you want to do through them. And from there, that they would actually use their gifts and find a spot to use their gifts for the benefit of the church, for the benefit of other believers, how you can use those gifts to help them serve others. We thank you for these gifts that you've given them, the ones that they know about, the ones they don't know about. And we pray that you help them grow in those gifts. For all of us, Lord, we thank you for your impact in our lives and in our church. We praise you in Jesus' name.